hey, you never know. You may be sitting back at that table again, would you ever? No. No, you don't. No, no. Thank you so much. You no. uh, I actually am really excited for other people to get to do it, too. Yeah. You know? I, it, to me, it felt like TV grad school. It was like four years of like TV grad school, and now yeah. I'm good. Okay, so let's start with the title of your audio memoir, Bad Republican. <laughs> you said it's kind of like a, a good nickname, also makes for a great title. So what gives? Why did you, what exactly is a bad Republican in your eyes and why did you feel like that was appropriate, an appropriate title? It was actually uh, from a conversation my agent and I have had like a million times mm -hmm. where um, I would be like up for a job and I was like, well, do they want me to be the bad Republican on a <laughs> panel or a show or a project or whatever? They want me to be the commentator that's like the villain in a situation. Yeah, yeah. And then I sort of felt like that was my job when I worked at The View and many different spaces. And then it's also a joke because when I do things in conservative circles, I'm the bad Republican because I'm not the Trump supporter. Right. So it's like, it doesn't matter which sphere I'm in, I'm the bad Republican. And I just thought it was like kind of funny and irreverent and sort of like trying to take ownership of yeah. stereotypes and things, and I thought it was catchy too, so. Yeah. And there's some juicy stuff. <laughs> there is some juicy stuff. I mean, we gotta get to the juicy stuff. Some of the juicy stuff, of course, is about The View. You do not shy away mm -hmm. about your experience at The View. Did you give ABC, did you give The View a heads up on specifics in your book? No, because I had left the show, um, and I actually added a chapter because obviously I would be doing things like this and people would have questions about why I left. Yeah. And so I actually added, the, there's only one chapter on The View in the book and it's the last one. Right, the departure. Yeah. This has been a really wild uh, ride the past four years of my life. It's been uh, the, honestly the best of times and the worst of times in all ways on and off this show. Yeah, and I felt like I like gossip and I know people wanted to know and I think it's fair. You say joining The View was a hazing experience. Mm -hmm. You also say working on The View brings out the worst in people. It does. Another comment, Culture. the culture is so messed up it feels like quicksand, all very strong statements. You also say, quote, going back to the view, whatever camaraderie we established before was gone. This is in relation to your maternity leave. Yeah, I talk about the moment I decided to leave, which um, was the moment that I think, if you're a view fan, you probably remember, was was when Joy told me she didn't miss me. You okay, missed me somebody so much, answered, yeah. Joy. You Traitors. missed me so much when I was on maternity leave. You missed me so much. You missed fighting with me. Don't I did not. You miss fighting I did with not me. miss you. <laughs> okay, Zero. I, I just thought, like, I just don't think this is well. how women should be treated when they come back from maternity leave. Yeah. And I felt also like the camaraderie of the show had dissipated in COVID because of the satellite. The fact that we were physically apart from each other really hurt the show. I mean, there's nothing anyone could do about it, obviously, yeah. but it did have an impact. Have you moved on from that? Are yes. you expecting an apology? Do you no. want one? And people keep asking me if you saw any of the women on the show, what would you do? First of all, I'm still good friends with Sunny. Um, right. And I would, if I saw any of them, I would say hello and give them a hug, Joy included. And I wish them really? the best. You know, I felt like for so long, when I talked about the hazing period in the show, it was more that the second week I was there, there was a bunch of articles on gossip sites talking about how nobody liked me on the show yeah. and I was a disappointment and I was an ice queen and an ice princess and I was so cold backstage. And I had been there like less than two weeks and I it was hard for me to understand why people were basically talking you know, about someone who just got there. Yeah. So when I say hazing, that's what I'm talking about. Like right. the, the media hazing. Yeah. And I didn't realize that like, this is the world that I was gonna subsist in now that every time I walked into a building, there could be something when I leave. Your relationship with Whoopi, it seemingly started so good. You refer to your relationship with her in the beginning as being maternal. <clears throat> she told your dad that she was basically gonna have your back. What was the catalyst that sparked what was seemingly this negative dive in y'all's relationship. I don't care and that you don't like care. Trump. Just hear what well, I'm saying. I don't saying. care that okay, you don't care. We're gonna we'll go, so we're gonna go. Well, then good, Megan. Then you can be how you always are. We'll be right back. You can right be back. how you always are. Where did things go wrong between you and Whoopi? I think again, it was COVID and really? being via satellite. I do, I also think that um, Trump years were really arduous and intense for everyone. And I think sometimes I'm the only conservative person people come into contact with in media and certainly on The View. And I just think that there were moments in time that she doesn't realize how powerful she is. And she's one of the most powerful American women of all time, one of the most talented actresses, one of the most talented broadcasters. Mm -hmm. She's a living legend. And even small slights, the audience is very savvy. They can pick up on things. But we had a really beautiful ending. What did that ending look like? We just had a lovely conversation when I left and she sent me some really lovely text messages. And then 
Um, well, I, you know, obviously I, I don't want to like reveal too much, yeah. but I really wish Whoopi all the best. I will always love her. I think she probably has, still has love for me someplace too. And hey, um, you never know. You may be sitting back at that table again. Would you ever? No. No, you don't. No, thank you so much. You no. don't. Uh, I actually am really excited for other people to get to do it too. Yeah. You know, I, it, to me it felt like TV grad school. It's like four years of like TV grad school and now yeah. I'm good. Regarding your time at The View, you say it was never the hosts that were the issues. It was the backstage bull in yes. the media. Uh -huh. But you do write that the hosts did play a part. But in a they sense. weren't the ones that were saying crap in the media. Okay. And that I could deal with host drama all day long. Yeah. To me, the thing that started having a real impact on my mental and emotional health was the the constant, and it became constant, like mm -hmm. absolute constant, like leaking up from the show. Wow. I mean, I'm telling you, this audio memoir is very <laughs> eye-opening, to say the least. I hope people like it. It's not meant to be like scorched earth. Maybe no. it comes off that way. Again, it's a privilege to be on The View. It yeah. really is. It's one of the most coveted jobs in all of television, and it was truly an honor to do it. It was just the specific period of time I was on it. It's interesting because I have become very friendly with Elizabeth Hasselbeck and we sort of, when I left the show, we traded war stories and she was on during the Bush years and I was on during the Trump years. And I do think there's something about being on that show when you're a conservative under a conservative presidency yeah. that adds a different element to it because you are on the defense, mm -hmm. which is much harder than being on the offense politically. And um, yeah, I mean, but I really I have no regrets. I mean, yeah. it was a fantastic time. Yeah. So much of it too. Like I had a great time. I just, you know, I'm one of two hosts that wasn't fired. I quit. Like, so I think that says something too. I think leaving on my own terms was really important to me yeah. and leaving my way and not being sucked into, um, you know, the paranoia of not knowing when, when your last show is. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't, I really feel like it was a liberating experience. It was really tough and hard, but I also like so many people in America and the world, I really got a pause to reassess what I wanted my life to look like. You said that one of the most difficult aspects of the book to write was about your father's passing, mm -hmm. and you write about it in really excruciating detail. I mean, it was, you know, having experienced the loss of my own father to Sorry. cancer, thank you, and uh, being there for his death, it is, when you watch your father pass or anyone pass, for that matter, it's a very sacred and intimate moment. Mm -hmm. Why did you want to share the sacred and intimate moment of your father passing with your, your listeners? Because I didn't know what death would be like. And because I describe in the Audible book that I became obsessed with it. I became obsessed with the last moments of, of anyone's life and what the process of dying is like. And I'm a sharer and I'm very open. And my dad was very open with his cancer and with his process yeah. to, into going on to the next life. And I think he would have been entertained and appreciated that I was trying to share my experience with cancer and my experience with his death. And, and I sort of wanted to give context to why, if people thought that I was so emotionally charged, because I was, because yeah. I had gone through so much and then I had to go not straight back on TV because I, I took bereavement leave, but pretty soon back on television. And it's not like, you know, you know, I, I lost to someone who was, a, you know, a person people didn't know. Right. People, everyone knows who my dad was. So, um, I don't know, I'm also just a sharer. And I felt like, again, I had this incredible opportunity with Audible to tell stories and I feel like people, maybe I'm wrong, but I do feel like people want to know the truth and want to know what really happened.